Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. And thank you, Krisha, for organizing this incredible event and for that lovely introduction. I want to start off with a short story. About a month ago, I was coming home from the airport in a taxi with my family. Our driver was a very nice guy, very friendly, and he started talking to us about his history. He was born in Ghana, he said. He grew up there, he went to school there, he got a master's in education from a local university, and he was a history teacher for young children. And he spoke with such passion in his voice about education, and so I asked him, do you want to be a teacher in the United States? And he said, more than anything, maybe someday. Maybe someday I'll have the opportunity to teach again. But for now, I'm just a cab driver. And his story really got me thinking about the last time that I was in a cab, and the time before that. Were my drivers immigrants then, too? In fact, let's all take a second and think about the last taxi drive you were in. Has anybody in this room been in a cab that wasn't driven by an immigrant? It's almost like driving a cab is a requirement for getting your visa. There's a lot of cab drivers who are immigrants. But what other kinds of jobs do immigrants have? Do you visualize day laborers picking produce? Maybe. What about those signs by the side of the road, polishmaids.net? That's a real website, and it's a job. You see, immigrants fill jobs across our entire economic spectrum. But hearing this story about the man from Ghana got me thinking about the stories of other immigrants, about their educational backgrounds, and about how it led them to their current professional employment. Today, we're going to look at two stories of two immigrants. Katya is an immigrant from Kazakhstan. She came to the United States in 2001 with her then 11-year-old daughter, Asya. She had never lived anywhere but Kazakhstan. She spoke only Russian with a little bit of English and a heavy accent. She went to University of Almaty in Kazakhstan, and she worked as a civil engineer for nearly eight years before she came to the United States. And yet, at 30, she chose to move across an ocean to the United States in search of greater opportunity for herself and for her daughter. Minyon is an immigrant from Myanmar. And though her educational opportunities have been significantly different, her passion for learning is the same. Minyon actually immigrated to the United States about two years ago from Malaysia, where she moved four years ago after escaping sectarian violence in Myanmar. Minyon spent her entire life running from gunfire, beatings, rape. She coaxed children along with her tribe to run deeper into the jungles of North Myanmar to escape government oppression. Her only education was some workbooks that had been snuck in a care box across a neighboring border, but other than that, she had received no schooling. If these two women's stories seem remarkably different to you, they are, and let them serve as an example of the wide spectrum of histories for immigrants. But we'll start their stories today at the beginning at arrival in the United States. One year after Katya, the immigrant from Kazakhstan, moved to the United States, she had a baby. And so now, in, in between of caring for this child, helping her older daughter learn English, and learning it herself, Katya decided that it was time to try to find a job. But those opportunities that she had sought upon coming to the United States weren't really there for her. You know, it wasn't like she could just go to a local engineering firm and get a job like that. Her certifications didn't transfer. She didn't speak English well enough. The only job and the only project that she had had on her resume was from a town in the middle of Kazakhstan that no one has ever heard of. What hiring manager in the middle of rural Nebraska has ever heard of Kizil Orda? And so she wasn't able to get those jobs that fit her qualifications. Mignon was going through a similar problem. She, too, was focused on organizing her household, raising her three young children, and was forced to take a job on a factory floor in order to earn what was barely a living wage for her family. But she continued to study at home, going through math textbooks and attempting to educate herself. And yet, she still works on that factory floor. You see, both Katya and Mignon are struggling with the same things. They work hard to advance themselves and to adjust to life within the United States. They are both vastly skilled in different areas, and they are both working below their skill levels. There's a name for this issue. It's called occupational mismatch. Occupational mismatch is defined as a discrepancy between a worker's skills and competencies and those required by their job. 
It's something which affects nearly every immigrant that lives in the United States and across the world, and it's something which is little known in the United States, and yet it impacts so many people. The Center for Immigration Studies found in 2018 that among college-educated immigrants within the United States, 20% were either unemployed or working below their skill level. Extend that to immigrants with advanced degrees, and they found that only 37% had a long-term professional career, as compared with 50% of native-born American counterparts. But this problem isn't exclusive to the United States. In Europe, too, they've been documenting the issue for over a decade. They found that there is a pervasive international phenomenon of poor job match for immigrants and the positions that they hold. The key problems we're dealing with today is that we have a rapidly aging population, which leads to problems like skill obsoletism. We need to figure out how to incentivize companies to both encourage growth and cut down on unemployment. And all road signs point towards ensuring that every citizen's full potential is utilized. But this issue isn't exclusive to the Eastern Hemisphere. In Canada, too, they found it to be a pervasive issue, seeing that immigrants working in jobs below their skill level has been on the rise. The key problems here, they found, is a lack of pre-immigration education and poor market integration upon arrival in Canada. This is a problem which affects immigrants across the world, and it's a growing international phenomenon. And it's something that we have to start talking about more. The first and most important thing to discuss is the perspective of the immigrant. Now, everyone, at one point in their lives or another, has been stuck. Stuck in a relationship, stuck in a job that didn't fit, stuck trying to find the purpose to move forward. And for most people, stuck is just a stop on the way to success. But for immigrants, stuck can describe their entire adult careers. Let's go back to Katya and Minyan's story to see just how true this is. When we left Katya, she had just received an elementary engineering position at a local company, and yet this position was far below what her qualifications could enable her to do. She recognized that she wouldn't be able to get a higher position until she figured out how to transfer some of her educational credits to the United States, and she wasn't alone. The Chicago Tribune reports that in 2018, Many people that are already living in the United States have found that their skills frequently are put to waste because of lengthy recertification processes, their inability to speak English, and the basic fact that they don't have a familiarity with the English hiring process. And thus, they get stuck in jobs taking them just to get by as valets, janitors, babysitters, taxi drivers, and they're unable to self-educate to get out of those positions. And this is not a small issue. That year, there were two million immigrants that were either unemployed or working below their skill level despite years of college education. Look even smaller, just at Illinois, and there were 334,000 immigrants that were working below their skill levels within Illinois alone. So what's the problem here? What's actually stopping immigrants from getting the education and from getting the jobs that they're qualified for? There's a myriad of factors. First is the competitive job market itself. Even those born and raised in the United States have difficulty gaining professional employment. But think about how much more difficult this issue is if you haven't been raised on the idea of a job hunt, as so many of us are. Immigrants don't learn the necessities of a resume like we learn our ABCs, and they're unfamiliar with the process, which makes it just that much harder. But more than that, it's the idea that immigrants get trapped within a cycle. They come to the United States with low savings, and they take jobs to get by, and those jobs frequently have inconvenient hours, rendering them unable to continue to go to school if they can afford to take those classes with the minimum wage they frequently earn. And thus, they get trapped in a cycle, unable to go to classes, unable to self-educate in English, where the opportunities to do so are even slimmer. They become stuck. And this isn't something which only impacts those who are highly educated. Immigrants like Minyan, too, deal with the issue of becoming stuck in a survival job, which was always meant to be temporary. And though the idea of being overqualified is slightly diminished in her case, the idea that she cannot advance her own education and career is the same. Both Minyan and Katya are also struggling with the fact that there's a social perception that people who come to America, immigrants that come to America, 
come to take minimum wage jobs and drive Americans out of the labor force. How many times have you heard this argument? And yet, let's think about it logically for a second. For those who are highly educated, this simply cannot be the case, because those who worked as lawyers and doctors in their previous countries want to fulfill those same positions within the United States. They want to serve that desperately needed position of being a professional within an ethnic community, someone who understands the language, the cultural nuances, and are able to fully explain for the people in that community to serve their needs for a professional person that understands them and can work with them. Those positions are what need to be filled. And even those like Minya seek greater things than just serving themselves. Minyan, for example, wants to become an advanced manufacturer so that she can get a better degree, a higher job and salary wage, and then begin her lifelong dream of sending home educational materials, clothes, and food to her home tribe in Myanmar. Immigrants seek to give back to their communities, but it's not just their communities which can benefit from them realizing their full potential. The United States, too, stands to benefit so much from immigrants being able to utilize their education within the United States. And we can look at this with just a few concrete numbers. A five-year study was done from 2009 to 2013, which found that there were 7.6 million immigrants living in America, and there were a quarter of them who were either unemployed or working below their skill levels. Looking even smaller into this group, there were 470,000 immigrants who were ready to take on positions in the STEM field. People like Katya, people with skills in mathematics, science, research, engineering, who were prepared to fill those chronically difficult to fill STEM positions within our economy. We had a shortage of people prepared to fill those positions, and we have the talent waiting to fill them. And yet, we need to be considering how we can actually help immigrants get into those positions. That is how we can continue to move forward. Even more specifically, let's look at the economics of the situation. Those same immigrants could have generated $39.4 billion in personal income and an additional $10.2 billion in tax revenue for the United States. So helping immigrants isn't just a humanitarian issue, but it's downright economical. And it's something that we must consider how we're going to do in the future. So now that we've established something must be done about the issue, let's talk about what we can do. And we'll start by looking at what's already being done. Across the nation, organizations like Upwardly Global focus on helping immigrants find the professional jobs and careers which they need. They partner adult, adult professional volunteers within a particular job spectrum to immigrants that have just moved to the United States. And those volunteers serve as a mentor, as someone who can help coach them through interviews, through writing a resume, and through finding job connections within their community. To date, they've helped over 6,000 immigrants find the professional careers that they were looking for. Organizations like these and organizations like World Relief and Dialect, two smaller local organizations, are the kinds of things which can help immigrants like Mignon. Mignon is currently working through a joint program offered by World Relief and Dialect, which will give her a vocational education and will help her advance her salary and career status. I personally work with Mignon every week on developing her math, reading comprehension, and interview skills, and I have found her to be extremely adept with mathematics. And through this program, I have watched her advance beyond belief. Programs like these are changing the lives of immigrants across our nation and helping them get into their advanced positions. Businesses, too, need to take a stronger look at how they can help immigrants integrate into the market. Countless studies have shown the benefit of increased diversity within the workplace. One found that an increased diversity level led to a 19% increase in revenue collection for that company. This, of course, makes sense because increased nationality diversity means increased intellectual diversity, which means more ideas, greater innovation, more solutions and better solutions to the problems that companies are currently dealing with. Companies should put in a bit of investment up front, implementing training programs that help integrate immigrants within the company, help them transfer their educational opportunities and ideas into the American marketplace. This small investment up front can lead to huge payoffs later, both for the company in terms of their increased revenue and for the immigrant in terms of their job opportunity. Finally, 
Every single one of us should take the initiative to create space for the immigrants in our lives, whether that means volunteering for a local organization or petitioning a local politician to put more funding towards vocational programs. It might mean supporting your mother, father, sister, or brother as they work to pursue an education, just as Katya did. With the support of her family, Katya graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln after two years with a master's in engineering and a 4.0 GPA, as she would take care to mention frequently. And I would know because she's my mom. Helping people like Katya and Minyan work throughout... Thank you. It's her you should be proud of. She has the good GPA. Helping immigrants like Katya and Minyan work throughout their education and work to gain professional employment in the United States is vitally important for them and for our own survival in the future. Each of us should take the same initiative as their communities have to help raise them and walk together towards a better future for them, for us, and for our nation. Thank you very much.